a space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. It's not sci-fi. But, as always, there is a catch. Look at this tiny deserted asteroid. It may look lonely and barren, but if you peek inside, you'll see life blooming inside of it. These days, many people now live right inside these asteroids. It's not sci-fi. According to researchers, we might be able to create futuristic cities the size of Manhattan on gigantic space rocks. Of course, there's a catch. The asteroid we choose as our base has got to be at least a thousand feet wide. Though it's weird why life is inside this asteroid and not on its surface. You see, we can't really live right on asteroids. That's because we're not the little prince who indeed lived on an asteroid, according to the plot, but because there's too little gravity and too much radiation for us to handle if we chill outside. There are possible theoretical ways to stay on the surface, but it's going to be extravagant. So the only option is living inside asteroids. Nothing screams wildly theoretical like building an asteroid city. Living in space without any gravity isn't as romantic as it sounds. Researchers show that when people spend too much time in zero gravity, things start getting weird. Their eyeballs pop out, retinas detach, muscles shrink, and bones become as fragile as a potato chip. But imagine this, a space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. If you've watched enough sci-fi, you'd picture a massive structure spinning round and round. It spins to create gravity for all the lucky folks living inside. There's an actual prototype of this wizardry, the O'Neill Cylinder. This device is named after a physicist, Gerard O'Neill, who came up with the idea for NASA in the 70s. Now, there isn't a ton of data on this, but humans need roughly one-third of Earth's gravity to function properly. An O'Neill Cylinder may not be able to generate massive amounts of gravity, but the genius behind it, Mr. O'Neill himself, design them to spin around their long axis. This device creates a gravity-like force called centrifugal force. So if we ever get to use that, we'll be living happily on the inner surface of the cylinder, feeling pulled downward away from the center. But as always, there is a catch. When the team crunched the numbers, they realized that the asteroids would break apart way before they could reach the speeds necessary to keep us grounded. And to make matters worse, most of these asteroids were more like loosely assembled piles of rock than a solid chunk. The small ones, like less than 6 miles across, are a mix of sand, pebbles, rocks, and boulders. They're all held together by the weak force of their own gravity. If you were to spin one of these asteroid buddies, all those parts would go flying off into space. Not cool. However, scientists didn't give up and they elaborated on the idea. They needed to find a way to keep the asteroids together. They played around with different ideas, and they produced something crazy. Now, if you were to carry all your personal belongings every day right in your hands, at some point, the situation would be out of your control. You'd have to collect all your stuff from the floor. But you're smart, and you carry a bag, right? Well, it seems that if we want to control an asteroid, all we need is a ginormous bag. But not just any bag, a massive, flexible, and super lightweight mesh bag made from teeny tiny carbon nanofibers. These fibers are like tubes that are only a few atoms wide, but boy are they strong. So once we've got this cylinder-shaped bag all set up, we can start slowly spinning the asteroid using rocket motors deep within the rubble. And as it spins faster and faster, it'll start flinging all those pebbles, rocks, and boulders. And guess what? The carbon nanowire webbing is going to go flying out with them. This bag will be expanding and expanding until it reaches its absolute limit. And then the rubble inside slams into the now super tight webbing. It's like a crazy explosion of debris compacting together to create this massive hollow cylinder made entirely of concrete. Once all the dust settles, you can build entire towns, cities, parks, and even farmland on the inside of the cylinder. This is like something straight out of O'Neill's designs. You can even enclose the whole inner surface with a transparent roof. Outside of this incredible living area, 
you've got these thick concrete walls that are like superhero shields protecting against radiation. So not only do you have this space to live in, but you're also super safe from any harmful stuff outside. We still don't have this magic bag, as those magic carbon nanowires aren't mass-produced yet. But scientists claim that, according to the laws of physics, a tiny asteroid, like a few football fields put together, can be transformed into 22 square miles of living space. As of now, about 1.5 million people are living in Manhattan, and there are like tens of thousands of asteroids just hanging around in our solar system. You do the math. Seems like everyone will have a sweet spot to crash in space. Building a city in space is no easy feat. The main challenge, still, is to create a self-sustaining closed system that can keep going for the long haul. You see, cities on Earth rely on a much larger area to survive than just their own boundaries. But in space, the farther away from external resources a space city is, the more it needs to close its loops for oxygen, water, and food. Take the ISS, for example. It's about 40% efficient in recycling oxygen. But even then, its CO2 levels are always sky-high. NASA is on the case, though, trying to figure out how to magically turn that CO2 back into oxygen. Once we've tackled the basics, like protecting ourselves from radiation, dealing with pesky gravity, and finding some air to breathe, it's time to get creative in space. Enter 3D printing and rocket engines, the dynamic duo that will pave the way for space settlements. With 3D printing, we can kiss goodbye to relying on Earth for spare parts. We'll simply whip them up locally, cutting out the middleman. We can even use 3D printers to whip up a delicious pizza in a couple of minutes. Of course, we'll need some fresh ingredients, but your dinner might just be a push button away in space. To truly thrive out there, we'll need to tap into the riches of asteroids. These celestial treasures are bursting with raw materials, perfect for creating solar arrays, building materials for our colonies, and so much more. And let's not forget about comets. These icy wonders are like cosmic water fountains, providing us with precious H2O for drinking, bathing, and even shielding ourselves from radiation. Plus, we can use that water to produce hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel and fuel cells. So, let's say we pull this off. Can you imagine people living or born in space might end up being different from you and me? Like if humans can have babies up there, these space colonies might develop some cool cultures. They might even come up with their own languages, and get this, they could even evolve new physical traits. It's wild to think that just after 300 years, a colony of 2,000 people could look and act so differently from us. They might have different hair textures, skin types, and even be taller or more slender to deal with that low-gravity situation. We might even develop new organs to protect us from cosmic rays. Or we'll have gill-like structures to breathe carbon dioxide. Hey, I know, it sounds crazy. But these scientists are working on developing these carbon nanotubes as we speak. So maybe one day, we'll be living it up on our very own asteroid crib. It might seem like asteroid cities are just too far-fetched. But let's take a trip back in time for a moment. In 1900, no one had ever flown in an airplane. But today, thousands of people are zooming through the sky, comfortably seated in chairs, traveling at hundreds of miles an hour high above the ground, unaware that their luggage is on another plane going to a different destination. Ah well. Imagine that it's the year 2025, and our planet has completely changed. Rising sea levels, extreme weather, and the ocean becoming more and more acidic are just some of the problems people have been dealing with for years. But in one of the world's largest coastal cities, the situation has become too serious. It was a sunny day in June when a massive earthquake shook the city to its core. The ground beneath people's feet heaved and shook, and buildings swayed dangerously. People ran through the streets in panic, trying to find safety. But as soon as the ground settled, the inhabitants of the city realized the real danger. A wall of water, almost 100 feet high, was rushing toward the city, propelled by the force of the earthquake. The tsunami hit the city with unimaginable force. Entire neighborhoods were wiped out, and thousands of people lost their lives. But here's where things get interesting. 
In the aftermath of the disaster, the city's authorities realized that they couldn't just rebuild the city as it was before. They needed to be better prepared for the next potential disaster. And so they came up with an incredibly ambitious project to build an underwater city. The goal was to create a self-sufficient, sustainable city beneath the ocean surface that could withstand any natural disaster. The underwater city would be powered by renewable energy, using tidal power and underwater solar panels. It would be designed to withstand extreme weather and would have its own emergency response systems. The project attracted some of the world's top scientists, engineers, and architects. They worked tirelessly to design the city and carefully considered every aspect of the project. The underwater city would have everything that a typical city had, from schools and hospitals to stores and restaurants. There would be underwater farms where fish and other marine creatures could grow. The city would even have its transportation system, advanced submarines and underwater tunnels connecting different parts of the city. The project became a shining beacon of hope for people. It showed that even in the face of disaster, we could come together to create something amazing. But as time went on, the project no longer seemed so perfect. The cost of the project turned out to be higher than planned. There were also concerns about how long such a project would exist. After all, the ocean is very unpredictable. And still, the team of scientists and engineers never gave up. After years of trial and error, they finally created the perfect underwater city. A marvel of engineering. A self-contained ecosystem that could sustain people indefinitely. The buildings were constructed from a material that could withstand the immense pressure at the bottom of the ocean. And the city itself was powered by a network of advanced hydroelectric turbines. It wasn't long before the first wave of colonists arrived at the underwater city. There were different people in this group, and each of them had their own reasons for choosing to live in this new world beneath the waves. Some were adventurers seeking a new world to explore, while others were hoping to escape natural disasters raging on dry land. But despite their differences, all these people shared a common goal, to build a new society, one that was in harmony with the natural world. The underwater city flourished and new discoveries were made every day. The colonists developed new technologies and ways to tame the power of the ocean. They learned to farm the sea and started cultivating underwater gardens that provided them with a steady food supply. But living underwater was challenging. People felt isolated and even claustrophobic. The situation came to a head when a group of activists started to protest against the city's expansion plans. They argued that the underwater city was a threat to the environment it was meant to protect and that the colonists should focus on reducing their impact on the delicate underwater life. The protests sparked a heated debate among the colonists. Some of them argued that the survival of the city depended on its growth and expansion. Others claimed that the city needed to prioritize the protection of the environment above all else. In the end, a compromise was reached. The city would continue to expand, but the main priority would be sustainability and a responsible attitude to nature. The colonists would do their best to reduce their impact on the environment by using new technologies and following strict conservation rules. And they would also remember the importance of protecting the ocean and its fragile ecosystem. Years went by, and the underwater city continued to thrive. New generations of colonists were born, and they grew up in a world entirely different from the one their ancestors had known. They never saw the world on the surface, but appreciated the beauty and complexity of the underwater world they called home. And as the years passed, the city became a symbol of hope for a world struggling with the devastating effects of climate change. It showed that despite all difficulties, people could come together to create a better world. It is a reminder that the future is not set in stone and that we can build it sustainably and in harmony with the natural world. We just can't get enough of Mars, can we? Everyone wants to go there and astronauts are now looking at caves on the red planet where they can live once people inhabit it. The planet itself has some similar characteristics to Earth. Yeah, it's somewhat smaller than Earth, but the time it takes for the planets to revolve around themselves is also similar, which is about a day. On paper, Mars might seem like a good idea given some similarities to Earth, but there are some factors we need to pay attention to before we consider stepping foot there. The temperature. Mars might look like a scorching hot planet like a freakishly large Sahara desert, but quite the opposite. It's really cold. 
Mars has a reputation for being a freezing, desolate, endless land that happens to have the largest mountain in our solar system thus far. So, within those mountains, astronauts and scientists are considering whether naturally built caves are the answer to our survival. Caves won't be the worst thing we'd live in considering our ancestors used to dwell in caves in communities. Logically, it's the best place to stay dry during a storm and keep warm. It's the best place for protection against predators like giant birds, elephants, and saber-toothed cats. We even had our first art shows in caves with evidence of cave art dated thousands of years ago. Caves are a good idea, and they can also help us save a lot of money when establishing a colony on Mars. Rather than building a fresh structure in the middle of an open plain, the cave structure will help and influence the architecture, potentially saving lots and lots of money. Going to Mars will be expensive. It's already expensive sending people to the moon and launching a rocket into space. So, we have to consider the logistics. Another thing to look out for is caves in the ground that are not necessarily stuck on mountains. Scientists believe that most potential places for humans to thrive are caves. These spaces are large enough to host large populations. So far, they identified nine caves as large as football fields. So what would life look like if we lived in caves on Mars? For one thing, sunlight would be hard to access. By the time we reach Mars, we would have the best technology to maximize our lifespan in a hostile environment, which means withstanding the harsh sun rays of Mars. Most likely, we would dig through the caves further underground where oxygen would be pumped for everyone to breathe. People can walk around casually, thinking they're on Earth, and to exit the caves, you would need to wear a special suit. These cave colonies would have dormitories for people to live in and special spaces for colony meetings, entertainment, grocery markets, schools, and other places that are needed to sustain a colony. There would also be indoor farms to grow crops and raise livestock. A team of experts mapped out what some of the dwellings will look like on Mars. And just like on Earth, we will have apartments for young professionals, family homes, and luxury mansions. Some of the dwelling units would be placed on the surface and not in caves. One of the key elements of the design and architecture is how to build it around the natural light to brighten up the homes. Another element is how to deflect radiation and cosmic rays. Because Mars has such a thin atmosphere, sun rays and other hazardous objects easily enter Mars. The dwelling units also have to be sturdy to protect them from severe dust storms and extreme cold temperatures. Some of the living pods or dwelling units that are for couples or singles would have tunnels leading to a shared workspace and garden. Studies show that even being in the presence of greenery can reduce stress levels significantly. And on the red planet, we would definitely need some greenery. We can expect the family homes to be built within the caves, not necessarily underground. It would be tempting to head outside with the view of Mars, but the large thick glass would prevent anything from coming in and out. Those who are underground with a view rely on LEDs and camera systems to screen the surface landscape of Mars so it acts like real windows. And if you're bored of the surface, you can always switch the channel and watch something else as you please. Maybe a flowing river surrounded by trees, or maybe a penthouse view of all of New York. The choice is yours. There would be a driveway that leads to a garage so one can enter and exit easily. There won't really be a reason to exit the cave colony except probably to visit other cave colonies. In this case, we would have highly crafted vehicles that will take people from colony to colony on the surface. The vehicles can withstand harsh temperatures and would be constantly transporting people daily. Some people might live in a certain colony and have to commute to work every day in other colonies. Humans might not have to be working in dangerous conditions or on the surface. We would have robots that will do that for us. The thing about robots is that they don't need to be human-shaped to do a job. However, before transporting humans to space, we would need to create some human-like robots and land them on Mars. With the exact physical form, we can determine what would happen to people if they were on Mars. We would have robots for specific tasks, helping us with everything. Let's not forget artificial intelligence plays a major role in monitoring the systems and updating the functionalities of the colony. 
It'll know when certain systems need fixing, adjusting, renewing, and changing. We also need people to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary and also to make sure people are behaving and not breaking the law. Getting to Mars would be the earliest obstacle we will face. We've already launched some robots to explore the terrain and conduct some studies. At first, we would send robots to test the conditions and to build most of the infrastructure. To build a proper colony, we would have to send out young couples willing to dedicate their lives to the future and the future of their children. It won't be easy. In fact, there would be a variety of people with different professions and specializations to help establish the colony. People would have to work and establish a local economy. We would need scientists, doctors, farmers, teachers for the children, and engineers to maintain the structure. It will take time for the colony to reach a substantial size, but it's all part of the process. Even the spaceships would need to be large and sufficient to house thousands of people traveling from Earth. Of course, by then, most of the dwelling units would have been built, and people would have already picked out their houses, depending on if they were single or if they were about to start a family. Once the colony has the necessary professionals it needs, then come the other people who wish to start their life on Mars. People would need entertainment, so musicians would find a place in the colony. We can't expect everyone to go out on a nice sunny day to the beach, but perhaps one day, when the colony is large enough, there can be an artificial body of water with the same elements as the beach. Livestock animals would also be shipped from Earth to be raised on Mars, where they can populate for our nourishment. We can also bring most of the animals and establish a wildlife sanctuary for everyone to enjoy and for the animals to thrive. For now, humans are planning on reaching the red planet sooner than we think, and who knows, maybe you can be one of the first people to sign up and have your own little dwelling unit far away from Earth. <laughs>